all of you for being here. Um, I, this is really exciting stuff for folks like me and Mary, and I think Kyle too. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is basically the genesis of some work that we've done at UF for the last close to 10 years now, and work we've done building off of what Texas has for 20 plus years. Um, so real quick, and Mary covered this pretty good, so I'm going to go a little faster some of it, and then other spots I'll go uh, maybe slow down a little bit. So what do we need for DEF to occur, generally speaking? Well, you need a high temperature, and Mary showed some good graphs of that, above 70, above 80, and so on. Um, we need some sort of high sulfate to illuminate ratio, and I'll get a little more granular with that as we move forward. Uh, we need exposure to moisture. Cool thing is, if you got no moisture, you got no DEF. And so there's been some talk in some of the documents, well, can we specify concrete that doesn't get exposed to moisture, doesn't get DEF? And if it's interior, maybe, but otherwise, no. Um, I'm trying to get this thing to go forward, but it won't do it. Okay, so to me, that's all concrete, except for interior. I probably should have put that little caveat there, sorry. Um, and so Mary talked a little bit about the 23 table, which I'm going to get to next, but in 16, uh, 201 put out some recommendations where there was this aspect where we could have a type 1 uh, or type 5 or Portland cement with a one-day strength of 2800. So Portland cement only could have been considered okay to get up to 85C. And we recently revised that in the 23 spec, and now um, that's been nixed, which I think is for the better. On top of that, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this now and later, we can use blended cements. Everyone in the world knows that 1L cements are taking over or have taken over, however you want to talk about that, uh, whether you want to talk about history or, you know, um, what's going on with the latest news. Um, okay. And so real quick, I'm going to talk quickly about specs, and I'm going to get back into the chemistry of all this. But a number of states have specs as to what they limit temperature on. As you can see, we have perfect consensus. We have one temperature and all the states agree, so that's great news. Joking. Um, some states allow 180, some states allow 160, and the reasons for that are really dependent upon the state. My state of Florida allows 180, and I'm partially responsible for that. Also part of that is any mix of proof for math concrete in the state of Florida must have some sort of poslin, whether it's fly ash usually. I will talk about that in a minute too, or slag, so on. Okay. And so some of uh, Kevin Foliard's slides from his class uh, that he teaches at the grad level, at least he was teaching in 2008 like this, talks a little about why we get uh, DEF. So what do we really have going on? So in our, in our concrete, we have monosulfate, etringite, our C3S structure, and then when water hits it, we start getting CSH, right, our, our hardened cement paste, and that starts forming in an inner and outer, okay? And then for temps that are greater than 70C, we have that inner and outer CSH that start hardening, with that, because we get to the high temperatures, we get this dissolution of etringite. It basically dissolves, and that allows it to be encapsulated. That encapsulation um, then allows for um, a, a, a release, and that gets into the inner CSH. So basically what is happening is our etringite gets trapped. It gets trapped in the hardening concrete as it cures. This becomes very important um, as to why we've kind of progressed in the way we have at University of Florida. So that etching guy gets in there, hangs out again. Now you drop the temperature back to what are normal operating conditions, and you're fine. Well, not so much, because that will tend to expand over time and cause cracking, and we can see some spectacular exa examples of that, um, some of which Mary and I are going to talk about together today, because I'm going to touch on that as well. Okay, so the microscopy, Mary touched on this pretty well. Um, so, you know, what does DEF look like? And you got those rings hanging around, and this is some work that... Uh, you know, Jerry and Anthony have worked on, who are both sitting in the audience uh, with, with us today. I'll go a little faster. So part of this is, uh, you know, well, what are we going to do to predict the EF? And, and the late John Scalney, who is, uh, I guess, a colleague and a mentor of mine, basically said a long time ago, prediction is difficult, especially about the future, which made me laugh. And so now we're trying to do it. But getting back into why we even care about the EF to begin with, Mary very properly said that you know, a lot of this work comes from the precast industry. We have heat cured concrete, gets up to a certain temperature for a certain amount of time, and all of a sudden we have issues with DEF, right? And then some other work by Kellum, they basically said, okay, let's go ahead and basically recreate um, the uh, precast cycle. So we have a temperature at 23C, let that mortar cure, bring it up to whatever temperature, 70, 80, 90, for 12 hours, and then bring it back down, and let's see what happens. The food uh, work basically said, okay, this is 
pretty much a similar test to Kellum, but we're going to go ahead and after we store it for six more hours in our lawnmower, we're going to jack up the temperature dry, force this concrete to crack due to, you know, basically um, heat curing, and then we'll go ahead and store it so we can induce that, um, that water intrusion faster and get DEF uh, more rapidly. And so there's an awful lot of historical work, and I'm going to go through every single one of these papers in detail now. I'm not going to do that, okay? But what, what's the real story here? We have sulfate to illuminate ratios. We have some sort of work with alkalis, and there's a number of papers here. I did, um, again, this is a, a, a short list of what we've gone over, okay? Um, for the most part, I want to really just stick with sulfate to illuminate ratios. Not that all these other things aren't important, but I think for spec writing and using these things, I don't know if we're going to be able to actually say any one of our cements in service today, we can you know, uh, measure what's in there to this level. Okay, so let's keep it simple. Okay, and so in 1992, as, as Mary said, Day had done some work and got a sulfate to eliminate ratio. Heinz did some similar work, and Zhang, Zhang did some similar work as well. So what do we really see? Somewhere in this sulfate to eliminate ratio, of, you know, what is 0 0.6, 0 0.7, we start seeing that that's where ex expansion tends to take place. Okay? And so, and again, Mary and I are using the same... Uh, studies here, there's this green book, so my students, when they start working on DEF, they, they have to read portions of the green book, which goes back to 2002, and um, this is one of the first cases that I could find also that has field, um, we'll call it verification of mass concrete and DEF and bridges, but let me go ahead and talk about what they said in their conclusion statements. Basically, it's like, well, maybe the concrete cracked due to temperature differentials, Water got in there, and we have secondary etching guide formation. So the secondary etching guide formation versus delayed etching guide formation. I see Matt nodding, so you might talk about this a little bit later. Um, so this is something that where consensus doesn't always happen, as Mary, as Mary said in her presentation as well. What really caused it? Was it DEF, or was it basically cracked concrete that had SEF? Um, because any concrete that does have cracks in it, those cracks will fill up with something, and if you have enough, it will be... SEF, which is fine. It actually adds to um, a more, we'll say, dense pore structure, which is fine. Okay. This is one in the uh, USA. It's a very famous bridge that I'm not going to talk about, um, but that's what it looks like, and it happens here, too. All right. Um, and so what do we know about mass concrete? Well, it's not the same as precast concrete, obviously. Um, so historical DEF testing doesn't really consider this in 12-hour soak time and so on and so forth. And so there's myself and Jerry working on what is a large adiabatic block at the University of Florida labs. And, you know, when we went ahead and measured this block, we went and measured a temperature profile. It's insulated, so you have an uninsulated, you have an insulated. But what do we see? We see that we're getting, you know, higher temperatures for a little bit longer than 12 hours, obviously. And that's the point of the story. Even the uninsulated, you're getting a nice, you know, 18 plus hours of high temperature. So mass concrete and DEF are going to give a little bit of a different story than precast concrete and DEF. And the reason that becomes important is I believe that because the, CES, the CSH structure is more refined at later ages, any sulfates that are trapped in there are more likely to do damage, okay? Because there's nowhere for them to go. There's just not a poor structure for them to get away. Okay, so I'm going to call these our new contributions. Um, this is work we started for EPRI in 2022 and published a little bit later. So, but it is relatively new and it is helping us uh, make some decisions. You know, what is the threshold temperature? Um, and then what is it threshold temperature at SCMs? And then what should be the maximum allowable to avoid DEF? And so we're going to answer these questions as we go on. You know, can we hit that bullseye? Can we figure out exactly what we need to do to avoid DEF and everything's fine? And we really just go, these are the controls. We don't worry about DEF anymore. It's just fine. And so we have this new method that we've created uh, as part of that work. We would just hold it in, 30, in, in, in a storage for a higher soak time, and that's 36 hours, um, rather than... Um, the 12 hour soak, okay? And so we did a bunch of work. I'm not really gonna pour it in the 70 and 85, partially because that data has not yet been published and Jerry and I, we gotta, we gotta work on that, man. Anyway, um, so um, I am gonna talk about some of the, the data on the ordinary pole and cement. And so one of the things we talk about is DEF. And, and even, even today, uh, Rami was in the room prior to, was like, DEF, the problem that never goes away. I was like, oh, I haven't heard about it explained that way yet, but that sounds good too. But what is instability with the EF? How much expansion is too much? And so for testing in the lab, we went ahead and said, well, we looked around. No one gave any uniformity to that. You know, ASTM uh, 1293 has a test, 1260 has a test. And so we basically said, 
you know, we're going to use for our work a 0.1% uh, expansion limit and, you know, that anything that expands past that when we, when we do our heat cure and then soak it, we'll go ahead and say that's our, you know, failure. So if it's good enough for ASR, it's good enough for DEF, okay? Um, and look, I understand that's kind of a, a little bit of a joking state, and you say, well, no, it's not really good enough for DEF, and there's an argument for that, and I, and I appreciate the argument for that, but I am trying to do lab testing, I am trying to get answers. Are these systems stable? So again, what is instability? How do we define that, and is this safe? Um, so this is what we've, we've worked on, okay? Um, so uh, we investigated some mortars. Again, I'm gonna talk more about the 85 and 95 stuff. Uh, we use this proposed method, and basically, we accelerate the results. So, a little bit difficult to see, but the Kellum and Foo stuff is not really expanding very much. That's all down here after a couple years, and the expansion on the stuff that's being subjected to the higher cure time. Also remember, the Foo is a 12-hour test, then it ramps down, and then they jack up the heat again to crack it. So, all the, all the um, water intrusion and... and um, diffusion of, of calcium and whatever we have moving in out of the system is available. Everything's available to move, and it's mobile. In our case, we don't have that, so, but we're seeing expansion at much earlier ages. Maybe this is just good for a rapid screening test, if you want to call a test that takes 150 to 200 days rapid, but in the DEF world it is, right? Okay, and then type 3 cements, we see something similar. One of the things we also saw, I don't really have it specifically in this presentation, is we're used to calling a type 2 and a type 5 cement low, um, high sulfate resisting cements. And they are for external sulfate attack. But for internal sulfate attack, they are not. Because my illuminate ratio is low, I have a low aluminous cement, which means my sulfate to illuminate ratio is high, and therefore I have more of a propensity for DEF. That's very important to remember. So I don't like the term sulfate resisting cements because it leaves out half the story. And you know what? DEF is part of our problems too. We should acknowledge it accordingly. Okay. Um, and so we also have done work with uh, some ternaries and so on. Okay, so I've, I have given some of this. My apologies. And so what we see is 10% slag is, you know, giving us some expansion. There's some more data to be brought out on this. And we have Medicale. And, and like Terry's work, Terry Rum Lotion's work that uh, Mary referred to, I'm a, I'm a huge Medicale fan. You give me 10% Medicale and my illuminate ratio is right up and we're good. Same thing with fly ash too. Okay, so the good news is when we go through all this, can we hit the bullseye on some of these things? Well, yeah, we know what we should do with, you know, our ordinarily portable cement. We know what we should do with our cementitious materials that are supplementary. And we have a pretty good allowable specified temperature. So can we hit the bullseye? Yes. And what if the bullseye moves? Oh, it moved. So now we missed. Well, why? Well, I just talked about limestone cements, right? And they are, they are coming and they're here. Uh, we just changed the fly ash spec, so it's not even fly ash anymore, it's coal ash, so do we have any data on that? We do not. Do we have any data with coal ash? No. Do we have any data with limestone? Well, we got some coming. Do we have those combined? No. So, you know, it's, it's, it's great for a researcher because I get to say, hey, there's a lot more research we have to do, and, you know, we're always trying to make sure that we're selling our product, and our product is unknowns. Well, the industry's doing me the favor, I don't have to sell it, it sells itself. And alternative poslins, right? Glass, um, I had a call the other day about someone who wants to now use human waste sludge ash for that, so that's literally what you think it is in the concrete. Um, you go ahead and name it that, and we'll talk about it at the bar, I guess, later on. But So I'm, I'm, I'm saying the story's not quite over with what we're trying to do, and so when I look at this note here, I'm glad we have it here because we need guidance on it. But jury's still out, okay? I'm not sure that we're going to say that we run a 25% coal ash, not F ash, right, and say that's okay. I'm not sure if then we can start combining that with silica fume and we lower that further that we're going to be okay. Um, I, these, these, these thresholds might change. So what's the most important thing? Well, keep your temperatures low. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're hanging around below 185 and you're more like 175, I'm sure that's going to be okay. Am I going to sign and seal it? No, I'm not going to sign and seal it, but I feel a lot more comfortable with that. But I just, I just want to add, you know, a level of caution to using bullet two because it's good guidance, but it is not guidance that is supported by any amount of research that I've seen that I call defendable yet. Um, and with that, I'm going to close. I want to thank the folks at Electric Power Research Institute, especially David Scott for initial funding and, um, the folks at Florida DOT, um, and let me, 
as well. So we have David Scott at Epri, Rodrigo, and David Solonic at FDOT. And I have to acknowledge Kyle Writing because he said that he was, you know, my next door neighbor at UF, which means he gets to hear me complain a lot. The walls are thin there, so he hears me complain when I'm not even talking to him. It's not fair. I'm a loud New York guy, and Kyle's, a, you know, a very professional man, so he's stuck with me. Um, so that's everything I have. I think we have a little time for questions. I'm happy to take. Other than that, I'll close. Thank you.